captain's log. Space. Seems to go on and on forever. Like your favorite TV show that never got canceled. Not at all forcing you to make your own half-assed episode. After a thousand light years, I'm about to complete my 15-beer mission. This is the USB Aldrin's Buzz with a fuel delivery for BBR base. Over. You're coming in hot. Abort mission. Over. Don't tell me how to fly this vessel. Over. Oh, open the beer bay door, pal. We have liftoff. <laughs> Here's to another successful mission. You know it, buddy. That. I have. It was real cold. <laughs> Next time on Everybody Loves Hypnotoe. Uh oh. It looks like Alpha Base needs another fuel delivery. Admiral, we're out of fuel. Yeah. Oh, your God. What do we do? What can we do? Zod Hellebore here to introduce my earthy new beer, Old Fortran Light Extra Dark. As the first in my line of hostile new flavors, Old Fortran needs you to write the Old Fortran Light Extra Dark jingle. The talented lazy slob, I'm talking to you, that writes the winning jingle will take home a lifetime supply of Old Fortran Light Extra Dark. This is dream come true stuff. Once you try Old Fortran Light Extra Dark, you just won't want one. <gasps> Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Yeah. If those were chicks, they were way hot. Yeah. Never mind. His back isn't taking my calls and fog hat broke up. Two stories. Hey, Nixon. It's your old pal, Bender. Bender. How did you get my private dead phone number? It's classified. I won it while playing Russian roulette with President Putin. So, um, what do you want? Well, there's this contest that's giving away a lifetime supply of free beer. All you have to do is write the winning jingle. So you called me, the president of Earth, to help you write a beer jingle? No, I called you. The president of Earth to help me rig that contest so that I could win that free beef. Oh, this sounds interesting. <laughs> I like a good rigging. <laughs> we could start with a few incriminating pictures of the contest judge. Yeah. And then an anonymous call to the tablet. Yeah. A wiretap here, a death threat there, and the next thing you know, Nixon is swimming in free beer. No. I clearly said I'm getting that free beer. <laughs> Forget it. Tricky Dick only looks out for one person. Uh, Me. Uh, well, Fry? Ah, uh, Bender. I always appreciate it when you settle for me. And you know what? This jingle could be my own personal booze license. I always dreamed of winning a lifetime supply of something. And what with my ability to compute mad rhymes and... Your ability to exist. We're a shoe in for that beer, baby. And all I've done is exist since the 20th century. <laughs> beer, beer, beer. Who's out here harmonizing? And about beer, no less. Admiral Bender, I think we've got a new mission. There'll be no one to stop us. It's time. <laughs> you guys are still in here drinking beer. No, uh -huh. we just ran out. 
Yeah. I can't believe you two let me load the ship all by myself. You're right, we're... No. I'm sorry. Okay, but that doesn't change the fact that we were supposed to leave two hours ago. And? And? How do you think the professor's going to take this news? Good news, everyone. I'm so glad you haven't left yet. Oh, Lord. Before you drop that crate of giraffes, I need you to deliver this old science experiment of mine to Chopek 9. It just sold for twice its value on eBay. Um, do we really want those cute giraffes in the cargo hold next to what looks like a leaky handmade beryllium doomsday device? Oh my, no, no. It's the much cheaper Einsteinium 119. What about the giraffe? Oh, don't worry. If they get too close to the doomsday device, just use this spray bottle to give them a gentle correction. It's filled with acid. Cool. Oh, and watch out for space pirates. They do love atomic atomizing apparatuses. Hmm. Now, off you go. Oh. Come on, guys. Don't make me do all the work. Yeah, Fry. Don't make her do all the work. Yeah, 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 yeah. What you talking about? You're mutiny on a Strombo score. And it's not that I enjoy yelling at you guys. I really care about you. Ah, shut up, baby. I know it. And you're a bad influence on Frog. Ah! You know he'll do anything you tell him. On true. Yesterday I told him to drop dead. Sandor. I knew he wouldn't do it. Your lucky suicide boosts are expensive. Yeah, that's why I bought him a gift card. <laughs> that hell was worth bringing me beer free for a lifetime. Again. Hey, Amy. Hi, Sarah. I saw it. I saw it. I saw it. I saw it. Deadlier than a green snake or a sugarcane plant. Mm. <laughs> wow. Well, obviously, you don't seem too concerned. Well, you know what would make me feel a whole lot better if you are signed one of these. What is it? It's an updated waiver absolving Planet Express from gross negligence in the likely event of you dying while transporting this bomb. Hey, you didn't make us sign one of those when we delivered that brown of the peace celebration on Sphere on 9. That wasn't a bomb. That was just a, a mislabeled nuclear powered disco ball. <laughs> yeah, it was way groovy. Until Zach Brannigan came in and wanged it up. It wasn't the only thing he wanged up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and sir, I don't know what you're implying. Oh, well, let me clear things up for you. By not the only thing, I meant you. And by winged up, my man. Just because two people were accidentally locked alone in a sex swingatorium for five hours and had to disrobe because of a temperature malfunction doesn't mean they winged it up. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> and by malfunctioning thermostat, I mean, whoa! <laughs> Ow, my ass! Oh, what a beautiful day. Just smell that fresh air.
Admiral Banger never kicked me for insubordination. You know it, buddy! Ow! Oh! That reminds me. Zod Hellebore would recommend I drink another beer to avoid a hangover. I've had enough of these inebriation games. Games? Beer is no game. Beer is life! Did you at least secure the cargo? Yeah, I, uh, fed the professor's doomsday device and sealed the draft in an airtight container. So, hmm. Stupid. Alert! Suffocating direct cargo. Alert! Cargo ready. Oh. Idiot. Why am I not surprised? We don't normally let us handle the dangerous cargo. Damn, dressed at sharp. Ooh, pretty sharp. <laughs> You'd think they would have made that distinction by now. If these new regulations state it should be a duplicate signature. Hello! And how is everyone doing on this lovely day and whatnot? Doing great, Dr. D. And my dearest friend Hermes, how is the family? Oh, come on, give me some claw. Even a great oh. five would recognize the 4A designation, meaning it's a triplicate signature form with rudimentary fingerprints, DNA, and stool profiles in the addendum. Well, yeah. I just don't know what's going on down there at the central bureaucracy. I mean... <laughs> Bad news, everyone. What's wrong, Professor? I just remembered I forgot to replace that damaged under thruster on that rickety doomsday device I just sold. It's probably leaking hypersonic flexation. There's nothing about that sentence I didn't like. If it blows up, it won't kill the entire crew. Oh, oh, it's really not the problem. Because I got some designs updated no fault death waivers. Hurley, if that piece of junk I built explodes, it'll destroy the nearest solar system and more importantly, my impeccable eBay rating. Understood, Professor. I will take care of this perilous mission personally. <laughs> yes, yes. Zoidberg, get that bomb back here. What an honor. <laughs> I really hate that crab. Dodge beer. Looking for Dodge beer. I gotta find Dodge beer for my robot. That's me, baby. Yo, 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 Dr. D on the vid phone. Initiate Zoidberg protocol. Oh! Oh, ignore. Did you just post a photo with the doomsday device? My fans demand insight into my daily routine. Oh, and he's so photogenic. Don't forget musical. Musical! Of course, I'm humble. Oh, the humblest. Would you just please be stupid somewhere else? You mind if I do? We've got a beer jingle to tingle. Yeah, Leela. We're on a mission from Zod. Don't touch me. You're unbelievable. And all the word can wait. And the captain is someone you hate. Well, I think she's the best. You will never touch her chest. Hey! The best part of drinking beer is old fortress like extra dark. Why do I want a coffee so bad? <laughs> you know what that makes me think of, buddy? Beer! 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 It was good the way you held that. Thank you. Just get out! Aye, aye, Captain! Doop, 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 doo doo! We're all gonna die! Stupid selfie gave our position away. Now relax, they're probably just my adoring fans. There's a new vessel. Send them that in the store. Morning. Fans of yours, huh? We're boned. Uh, we're rolling, sir. Well, well, well. 
Brannigan here. Captain Brannigan. Zap. The zapper. I'm sure you were all upset, as millions of others were, that I wasn't included in this abomination of a fan film. Unfortunately, I was preoccupied with a dupe emergency. An alien planet sex machine broke down and I had to fill in, if you know what I mean, sexually. Needless to say, they won't be needing that pathetic machine again. You're welcome, Nymphalis 6.9. So, as you can see, there was a legitimate reason I wasn't included. <laughs> it had nothing to do with Leela's restraining order. You saw the uh, episode? You experienced the amazing disappointment of that lousy cliffhanger. Will the crew of the Planet Express ship survive the looming space battle? Will Leela save her precious miniature giraffes? What did Fry see in that death clock? What's the deal with that identical thing? Will Amy ever find the perfect color for her toenails? Will the professor save his impeccable eBay rating? Will Zoidberg retrieve the doomsday device? These and many other questions will be answered. Never. You know what? Cats, plants, dying area. This production's got no talent, no rights, no money. Sponsored by... Damn it! I told you, I don't care what the walks think.
Daddy, can you go to Luna Park Saturday? I'm too busy. Please. Uh oh. Sweetheart, my schedule just opened up. I love you. Thank you, Daddy. I love you. Yes, Jet clock. When you need to know when you're gonna go. Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested.com and wow, I'm on the bridge of the Planet Express ship. It's real! I'm going to take this in for a second. This is a fully built out set for a Futurama short film. I got switches, dials, panels, computers, animatronics. It's really a fan's dream come true and we're going to speak to that fan in just a moment. His name is Dan Lanigan, and he and his team have created what may be the ultimate fan film. Let's go check it out. So this is Dan Lanigan, the director and mastermind of, well, what's, the, you, what's the short film called? Well, we're working under the title Space Quest, but really we're, we're hoping to call it not Futurama, the Carbonite Maneuver. Awesome. It, it really is a Futurama fan film. It is, absolutely. You're clearly a fan. Oh, I'm a mega fan. I watched the show back when it aired live, episode one on. So, yes, I'm very familiar with the show. I mean, fans of the show, you can, you can quote the show. You can dress up for Halloween. You can build an elaborate cosplay. Right. But you're doing a whole film, and not just a scene. You're doing multiple scenes, multiple sets. Uh, a lot of interesting production, fabrication. Exactly. Uh, why, why this elaborate production? Well, uh, I have a background in television production, and I have been looking for an interesting project to work on that's scripted. And I thought, you know what? If I'm going to do my first scripted project, it might as well be a fan film that I absolutely adore and can put my heart into. It keeps building and building and building, and we've done this crazy uh, world of Futurama here. Is, is it one of those instances where like, the story came first, where you and your friends are hanging out, quoting, using Absolutely. voices, and then, oh, what if, you know, the show's over, but what if they went on this adventure? Exactly, exactly. Well, we, we've always come up with interesting scenarios that'd be fun, and then we thought, you know, why don't we do it ourselves, and okay, cartoon into live action, how would we pull that off? This short film will be at its core, a, a funny Futurama episode. Outside of all the cool visuals, it's all about story for me. So, you know, we'll, we'll, let's see what the fans think, really. That's what it'll come down to, is, is the fans think it's in the realm of Futurama, comedic-wise and character-wise. There's a distinct visual style. And Absolutely. to bring that visual style to a real-life production, real-world adaptation, uh, what are the elements you want to get in? Why did you decide to build, you know, the break room and also a full Planet Express ship. These are two core locations that are used multiple times on the show. We can do a lot with them. Uh, they're also, uh, the break room was more complicated than I originally thought, but it's relatively just four walls and a big window. The, the bridge of the Planet Express ship is another thing entirely, but it was important that we pull that off practically, that we can move around the set. And it's such a great design. I mean, we basically try to mirror everything we could off of the show. Um, we want it to feel surprisingly familiar, but at the same time, it's a new dimension. Because yeah. you want people to watch your short to immediately recognize it's not just that they got the look you know, and, and the performance is right, but also the way the jokes are told, the way exactly. it's shot. It's we want people to accept the reality that this is Futurama, or at least our version of Futurama, and you know, because the voices aren't going to be the same. You know, we're, we're, our actors are doing their own voices. You know, they're not, they don't look exactly like the characters, but we try to make it as close as we can without it feeling weird and without it feeling wrong. Yeah, I gotta imagine, you know, doing this, 
uh, there, there are lengths that you went to that maybe another pro production wouldn't have done just so you could play in those areas, do fun prosthetics, do fun animatronics, you know, build out a set, maybe more areas with Easter eggs that you wouldn't necessarily need just because if you're going to do it once, might as well blow it all out. I looked at this from a fan's perspective and I looked at this from a collector's perspective. It's like, I want to build this stuff. This stuff is cool and I want to get it on film and I want people to appreciate it. But is it fiscally the best choice? Probably not, but I think ultimately it will come out in the wash and, you know, the fans will have to tell us. And a lot of that will depend on the performances. Absolutely. I mean, you've built out the world, the physical world, but really it's going to be up to your actors Absolutely. to bring them to life with your direction. Yes. Well, let's meet some of those actors. Excellent. Sounds good. We'll bring them in. So now I'm joined by Cody Frederick and Katie Lanigan. You guys are the stars of the show. You guys played Fry and Leela. Yeah. Among other characters. Among other, yeah. I also played uh, Professor Farnsworth. So tell me about this challenge of trying to bring, you know, animated characters to life. You guys had a script, and then Cody, you worked on some of the script, uh, but what was the performance you wanted to bring? Was it exactly what people saw on the show? I think for Fry, you want to bring that aloofness that Fry has, you know? He's just kind of like there. He's out in the world, but he's also very lovable. For me, I wanted to make sure that I brought that out with Fry. And Billy West and Kate Skull do a great job. They, they own those characters. Yeah. And as good as an impression as any fan can do, that's not what you're going for. You don't want to do the impression. You want to get maybe some iconic lines in and maybe some mannerisms in. But what are those things that like, you also want to bring to the role yourself? Anytime you're developing a character, you want to bring parts of yourself to the character with still staying true to what that character is. Billy West nails Fry because Billy West is Fry. That's who he is. And he really created that. Uh, and I, I, I could never be that uh, as much as I try. So ideally, as long as I can bring the tone of Fry to to the screen, you know, I I, I, I would I would say I succeeded. So that's kind of that's my hope. I, yeah, yeah, and I would say you know for Katie Segal, Leela is a very strong and feminine character, um, and her Katie Segal's voice is amazing. Um, and you know, I think one of the challenges was for me, um, you know, working obviously like Cody said, not wanting to do. Uh, an impersonation or an impression, but still carrying some of those traits, those breathy traits, those sing-songy traits that so much of the vocal quality of what Leela is uh, to 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 the character. You're the character with <laughs> one eye. So how did you manage that, and what was that performance like? It was really difficult because my visibility in the character was like. 15%. I could see just out of the corners of, of the actual eye um, socket, and it made it very difficult to hit eye lines and, you know, really to see, you know, in close-ups, they would glue the entire eye shut. So um, it was definitely challenging on top of the mechanism that they had um, built for me, which I actually have here. Oh, as so you cool. Can see. Um, and so this would actually go on top of my head, and I have a detachable eye that's attached with a magnet that you would take in and out. Um, so during, say, you know, lunchtime or takes, I can take it off and have some visibility back. Um, and then I actually um, have the serve that's attached to the back um, where the motor is, and then the eyebrow is moving in the front while the serve's on. So that's actually puppeteered by someone off camera, and you're almost working in collaboration with them. You're acting, and they have to respond and move the eye the eyebrow based right. on your performance. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We practiced in the you know in the mirror, and you know before we started uh, filming, uh, just basically uh, different moves. You know, because I can feel it move under the skin of the makeup. So you know, say I I was there was a part where I was angry. I would you know purse my lips, and I could feel him shift my my eyebrow down. So it really did take a little bit of um, practice and almost like choreography in a way. Awesome. And yeah. in terms of transformation, you know, Fry's transformation, but also Professor Farnsworth, a huge transformation. Yeah. You played him as well, which is a brilliant bit of casting because they're, they're related. Yeah, you want to be able to keep that connection in peace. We have the makeup here. And Fry, I, I got, I, I wore some makeup with Fry. I wore a, I wore a nose, nose prosthetic because with Graining's characters, they all kind of have that look. Exactly. And Dan yeah. was really able to bring that. He really, he wanted to kind of match it so you kind of felt in that world. And so the nose that I wore, you know, it took 45 minutes. And then they applied this guy, which is six pieces. Dave Snyder 
put this on, you know, six pieces. It took a long time. Katie sat in the chair for three hours, four hours every day. And I sat in the chair for three or four hours for this for one day. You know, we're wearing this for 10 to 12 hours. And this is a big piece of, of, of skin. There's a lot of movement. It's surprising how much movement you can get out of these pieces. And almost like being a creature, almost. Yeah. Being very physical, which actually lends itself to comedy. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and for that, you know, you kind of get into that role. And, and my head was, when, when we took the casting of my whole head, you know, you bring it down and your chin has to be out. And this chin, this whole piece, the weight of it is there. So happy. And so it, you're feeling it. And so a part of you kind of becomes a bit you know, debilitated by the weight of this skin. So you kind of morph, you morph into the character. And I, and you know, it was, uh, I was really excited to play, to play this, to play this guy because, uh, you know, he's, he's just a crazy genius. And then in the weirdest ways. Right. It's, it's acting, which is like a job, but it's also you're playing. Yeah, exactly. Like you're having yeah, fun. fun. No, yeah. Yeah. that's the, what the project is about. It's yeah. a fan film, and from the attention to detail from, you know, the makeup, the prosthetics, the wardrobe, to even you have props. Like that's Leela's uh, computer, arm yeah. computer, and that you have actual like detail that like, the prop makers actually put in things that you'd never see in the animation. Well, and uh, you know, a lot of time was was spent on showing that. You yeah. Know. Well, these performances, transformations on your part, but you guys had a, an additional cast member that you also had to act against yeah. that wasn't performed by a human. Bender, of course, an animatronic. Wow, let's yeah. go meet Bender. When you set out to build this, or have this built, uh, what were your instructions to the build team? What did you want them to be, this Bender to be able to do? We were hoping to have uh, animatronic head, all the functions in the head and the arms. Turns out the arms were unrealistic, so we decided to go with rod puppets. Uh, we do have the fingers are controllable via uh, strings as well, so we can do manipulation of the hands. But most importantly is Bender needed to be able to emote. And that really came down to his eyes and his eyebrows. So we can get him a scared bender or we can get an angry bender by reversing it. And then also doing a practical mouth. And that was very difficult to come up with. The original team that built this was a team of one person, Martin Munet. Spectral Motion, uh, Bill Sturgeon and his team took what Martin built and basically fitted the eyes with the mechanisms, the mouth with the mechanisms, and the neck mechanism, which is a large motor inside him. So he's fully remote control uh, and can really work well with the good puppeteers, which we had some great puppeteers. Our puppeteer team worked with him, and basically they did a lot of improv with Cody playing Fry. Because this, this animatronic needs to act alongside it your does. cast members in not only the break room, but also this set in different places and Absolutely. be able to move around. Absolutely. Wow, it can't, it's not just a stationary prop. No, it's not. And what we would do is we would actually put him on a dolly rig and push him so that he can walk, and then we'd have the puppeteers behind him and then do puppeteer replacement, which is what we're doing now in post. That couch we were sitting on earlier in the break room, Bender sits there. There are actually yes. holes There's behind. replaceable cushions with holes, and he was basically, we had a, a puppeteer with his hand grabbing Bender's spine so he can move side to side. We had puppeteers laying at his feet to work his arms, and then we had four puppeteers off screen using remotes to do all the facial animation with the main puppeteer doing the voice and, and basically instigating the movements and such. Yeah, and, and the finish of Bender, you know, he's a metal robot, you know, on, in, in the show, you don't know, he, he's shiny metal ass, but he's not shiny here. You also need to have him look good on camera. Exactly, exactly. Well, I mean, initially a shiny robot would be very difficult to light and it would be, would be very awkward and he wouldn't look right because a uh, chrome bender just doesn't match. So we tried to get as close to the cartoon and still make it feel like it could be some sort of brushed metal. We, t we actually took a lot of time figuring out his paint scheme. It was very difficult to work out. And this is one of those things out of the production that, as a collector, you're, I, I'm just so delighted. Oh, about. I, I mean, I, I love Bender as a character, and I, you know, it's just, I'm so happy that I could be involved with it, uh, what little we've done. I mean, this is, you know, the Mac Reining and David X. Cohen's design, and all we've done is just brought it to life, but it's been fantastic. A one-of-a-kind thing. So much of that world brought to life in this short film, uh, which people can go and watch now. Yes, yes, so, please watch it. Thank you so much, Dan, for inviting us on set. Absolutely, to, to thanks really for coming out. Appreciate all this production detail, and uh, you guys should check that out. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. Shut up!
The original seeds of the project came together two and a half, three years ago. Dan and I and Andy were in a vehicle. We were in San Francisco. I look over Cody, and Cody had just started wearing his hair up. So he had this kind of pseudo hair horn, and he's wearing a white shirt and a red jacket. And I'm looking at him, and I'm like, he kind of looks like Philip Fry. And he's like, we should do a Futurama project. Yeah! All right, let's move on. Good cut. Cut. At first, I thought it was a little uh, insane, like crazy, because it, it is. Right away, I thought, yeah, all right, good idea, but yeah, you know, that's pretty complicated, and that'll never get done. But <laughs> I was wrong, basically. I'm a huge fan of Futurama. I was one of the original fans that actually watched it when it first aired. And I just love the idea that it was smart science fiction that was also comedy, because I'm a huge comedy buff. So it's just like, what the heck, let's do it. In the world of fan films, you'd see things like the Power Rangers, there's James Bond fan films, and Star Wars fan films, Star Trek fan films. They're a lot of fun, and the, the bar keeps getting raised for those. Three, two, one. <laughs> It's hard to bring an animated world to life in a 3D world. You know, we're such big fans. We really want to see it be the best that it can be and be as authentic to it as possible. So that was, like, I think one of the hardest things. We were like, oh, my God, is this, is this this, is this that? Dan pulled together through his contacts and experiences and people that he's worked with this team, and it's really a great team. They try to balance that bridge between realism and cartoonyism. It looks amazing. Every time, you know, because I'd be back in and out from Chicago and stuff, and every time I'd come I'd be amazed at uh, what they were able to accomplish with cardboard and stuff. Actually, the first things we really dived into was the Planet Express ship. So we went through many iterations of the ship. To try to stay as close as we could to the cartoon. And we also had restrictions on set space. How big was our set to place the ship? The design stayed pretty true to the cartoon. Anybody recognizes it as the ship is strong. Leo, who basically did most of the design on the ship, was the guy that I wanted to design the sets because he loved the show and he was super excited about doing it. From a production standpoint, to have it stand out above all these other fan films, you have to do things a little different. Lilo is a problem because nobody's ever really done a good Cyclops practically before. The makeup itself took about five or six hours to apply. I can see a little bit through the corners when they put the eye on. I don't know if you can see in there. You can only like kind of see my eyes still. In the end, it looked really, really nice. And it's something that uh, looks very original and very neat, you know. And, and you see it and you're like, oh, wow, that's pretty neat. I haven't seen it before. It was interesting being in the makeup and having to also, you know, act because you can see very little. It's been very difficult trying to figure out what level of realism to put into this, how realistic we want her to look, how realistic we want Fry. Now, Bender, on the other hand, you have this iconic character that's a robot. He can look like anything, so why not have him look like he did in the cartoon? Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Huh. I didn't know Liberace on the beer company. You see these puppeteers while we're filming, and you know that it's fake in a sense, but Bender just still has such real characteristics that he really does just seem like Bender. Once these puppeteers get together and sync up, he comes alive. I'm a little more glorious here. My shiny metal ass is now in three dimensions. Everyone can enjoy it. The Vasquez rock shoot was my favorite day. And so you already had that feel that it was going to be epic. The Zod Hellebore costume. Eric basically created this costume from scratch, and it's absolutely gorgeous. Eric had to dress about 14 or 15 models on the day, obviously making adjustments as they went. The visual effects that we use in the show are going to be in service to the practical effects. Awesome. Looks great. Dan's approach was to do as much practical as we can because it looks more authentic, it looks more real, especially with the kind of budget we, that we're playing with. We don't have the time or the man hours that we can put into somebody doing all of that. But a nice mix gives you a really good sense of reality, and then it gives the CGI something to, to base its lighting scenario on. As a director, Dan knows what he wants. He's got a great 